Thank you, Professor Lenski. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're, we're going to have a, a, a wonderful talk given about feminist approaches to criminal law. So thank you all for coming very, very much. And I just wanted to thank the people who helped put this event together. Uh, this was a place on great organizations, not only the Criminal Law Forum, and I'm Mary Stevens, I'm one of the co-presidents, and Leah Siegel is the other one, which is wonderful, but also the Practice Order Project, Law Students for Drug of Justice, and the Law Law Society uh, helped put this event together, but also the OCD was very helpful, the Student Bar Association was very helpful here, and also the IT people are also very kind and very helpful. So thank you to all the student organizations and groups, and now I want to pass it on to Professor Ornstein, who's going to give a little speaker introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda, for your tremendous hard work, and that's why uh, Taz, as he is known to people, is here today. Uh, it's, it's traditional, you know, when you are the chump who was chosen to do the introduction, to say, it is my pleasure. And I cannot say how much it is my genuine pleasure to have Professor Andrew Tazas here. Um, he has taught at Duke, at Howard, at Villanova, <coughs> and now is an American. He has just an amazing wide range of subjects, including search and seizure, sexual assault, hate crimes, freedom of speech. And uh, from my, he has been named as one of the best 26 lost teachers in, uh, in America in a book called What the Best Law Teachers Do that is forthcoming from Harvard in later this year. But for my mind, I, and I know Taz since we were both untenured going to conferences, um, <laughs> you know, hoping to dodge the old people who now we are. <laughs> I think we went to uh, Thelma and Louise together <laughs> in one of our evidence conferences. But I think what I, I admire so much about Taz, in addition to the breadth of his learning, he's written over 100 articles and seven books, is the fact that he manages to meld uh, public service and law school scholarship, both at the highest levels. Uh, uh, one of the best talks that our faculty has been free to was when Taz came two years ago to talk about his work as a, um, a reporter for a uniform law commission uh, studying eyewitness identification procedures and a specific um, uniform law that would require videotaping of all confessions. Uh, and what it was is a great combination of the intellectual legal questions and how do we make law fairer in America in a practical way, bringing his incredible academic street cred to changing how law is practiced. So I, with this great admiration and, and, and excitement that I turn this over to Professor Andy Tess. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Thanks for that warm welcome uh, and that great introduction. I uh, appreciate it. Um, so I'm a little nervous about my talk today, and I'll tell you why I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, what it is like to be a feminist criminal lawyer uh, and give you a taste of how you can get there. And so that's going to be my general theme. Uh, and I didn't know how to do that without getting somewhat personal, and you'll see why in a minute. And I'm fine with this being taped, but I didn't realize it's being taped. So I'm going to have to apologize to my sister in advance, and you'll, you'll see why. So don't tell her that this is going to be on the internet. Um, so, uh, so I want to talk out, start by, by saying, how do, you know, what is feminism, right? We have to talk about what is feminism. And to answer that question, I, I, I want you to keep in mind that I don't think anyone is an ideal feminist. I don't think anyone is, is, or feminism is a goal. It's a thing you achieve, because once you achieve something, it's over. And I don't claim to be any kind of icon of feminism. In fact, I want to give you a story both to illustrate my imperfections and to try and convey to you what um, I think feminism really is. So um, I'm married to a wonderful woman, I want to be right in front of the camera, to a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful woman. And, uh, and as spouses will do, she, uh, she will sometimes come home from work and complain about work, something's happened, or 
she's having a particularly difficult problem at work and is trying to figure it out. And I would often offer advice. I'd say, well, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And she would get angry at me. And I couldn't understand, I'm being a good spouse. Why would she get angry at me for offering her help? Isn't that what spouses do? They help one another. Well, one day we're sitting in bed and she's reading a book by Deborah Tannen. Has anyone here ever heard of Deborah Tannen? Okay, a few of you. So Deborah Tannen is a linguist, a very well-respected linguist. And she wrote a book called Please Understand Me. And it is about on average differences. On average, it's important to say on average. Keep that in mind every time you talk about any kind of differences. On average differences in the ways that men and women communicate. So she said, I want you to listen to me as I read this aloud. <laughs> and she read aloud when Deborah Tannen wrote that men like to use conversation as a way of establishing status and power over others. And that women are more likely to want to use it as a way to bond. And that when a man offers advice to his dear significant other when she is trying to bond, he is establishing that he is the giver of knowledge and she is the receiver of knowledge. And that is insulting because it puts her in a one down position. She said, I don't need your advice. I know what to do. I'm not telling you to give this. For, I don't want your advice. If I want your advice, I'll ask for it. And she does sometimes ask for it. And I went, whoa trying to be a good husband, I've been a rotten husband and a rotten feminist. So how did I change personally and what did this teach me about feminism? Uh, personally, when my wife complains now, I listen. And I don't say anything unless she asks for advice except, really, what happened next? <laughs> and secondly, I really listen, right? I work at not thinking about gee, how am I going to solve this problem in this article while I'm nodding my head, right? I work at really listening. So this taught me a couple of things. Uh, feminism is never an achievement. It is a struggle. It is a goal. It is a lifelong struggle. Uh, number two, that's a good thing. Struggle is what gives life meaning. Uh, number three, don't be arrogant, because you're never as good as you think. And number four, power is always at play in all of social life, even those with those we love most dearly. So be careful you use power for good and not evil, or as my personal hero Spider-Man used to say, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, now, given that, okay, so feminism is a struggle, but a struggle for what? To achieve what? Well, I wanna make one point from the news just the other day about the need for continuing struggle. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with sexual assault. So have any of you ever heard of Steve Landsberg? Anyone here heard of Steve Landsberg? He's an economist and he writes those uh, economics for dummies books and those, those kinds of things. So the Steubenville, Ohio case, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that case, right? But this is a case where there was a, essentially a gang rape of a woman and uh, uh, she's unconscious. She's not aware of what's happening. And she only finds out she's been raped uh, when they uh, post on YouTube the videos they've taken of the rape. So Steve Lensberg posts on his website the following. Uh, he says, uh, hypo one, someone is mentally traumatized by knowing there are people who watch porn. But well, we wouldn't punish someone for that just because you, you're upset. That's too bad. They enjoy porn. They get benefit from porn. Hypo number two, somebody is really upset because the wilderness is being desecrated. Well, you're not going to punish someone because we can't criminally punish someone because you don't like that the wilderness is being desecrated, that some people support that. They get pleasure out of it. It's none of your business. Hypo number three, the Steubenville case. So here's what he says. He says, let's suppose you or I, I'm going to quote fairly extensive here, or someone we love or someone we care about is raped while unconscious. Desp uh, but there's no, assume no physical damage and the um, woman doesn't know any 
thing about what happened until she later learns about it on YouTube. Ought we to discourage such acts of rape? And he says, I don't see any difference between this question and the despoiling the forest question or the knowing other people watch uh, porn question. Uh, he says, as long as I'm safely unconscious and therefore shielded from the costs of an assault, why shouldn't the rest of the world, including the attackers, be allowed to reap the benefits? And if the thought of the, he's, this is a very well respected economist, <laughs> as well as being, and if the thought of those benefits make me shudder, why should my shuddering be accord any more public policy weight than Bob's or Granola's in his stories? Every time someone on my street turns on her, and he dismisses the idea, well, there's, there's an invasion of the body. Every time someone on my street turns on a, a porch light, trillions of photons penetrate my body. They cause me no physical harm, and therefore the law does nothing to restrain them. Even if those trillions of tiny penetrations cause me deep psychic distress, the law should ignore them, and this case is no different. All right. So those attitudes may not be expressed very often on college campuses, although they are sometimes expressed. Uh, but when they're not expressed, they tend to be working at a subconscious level. So get back to what is feminism. It's a struggle, but a struggle for what? Uh, and I define it as a struggle to learn from the experience, both the historical experiences and the present experiences of women, to learn. And why do I define it that way? Well, partly because there are different kinds of feminisms. There's radical feminism, and there's you know, uh, linguistic feminism, and there's, you know, there, everybody has their own feminism. Um, and uh, we don't have a Taz feminism yet, but um, you know, uh, I'd be OK with that term. Uh, but, uh, but they all should share learning from women. Well, why learn from women? What's so special about women? Why learn from women? A um, couple of reasons. Uh, I think that the learning is to learn about oppression, to learn about the nature of oppression. And in any kind of oppression, women get the worst of it. So in American slavery, female slaves had even worse a time of it than the male slaves did, as horrible as that is for uh, everyone. Um, women shed a light, understanding women's experience sheds a light on oppression. Number two, women's voices historically have not been fully heard. Even today, where interestingly, women on average, except in the uh, engineering and math, I think, and that's changing too, outperform men by miles. On, on average, let me stress this on average idea, in uh, universities, everywhere. Uh, my wife's opinion, so yes, she's essentializing here, is that it's because women are inherently superior to men, and now you give women a chance, that's just the way it is, and get used to it. Uh, uh, but, uh, but despite that, women don't have uh, the, the, the same degree of power, they don't have the same voice, uh, voice that men do. Uh, and Inherent in me in learning from the experience of women is the idea, the saying, that the personal is political. The personal is political. Uh, and so I want to talk about what, what that means. What does it mean to say the personal is political? Well, it means politics, the struggle for power. The example I gave earlier from my conversation with my wife uh, infects personal relationships, private relationships. It means that private relationships affect public attitudes and public policy. Uh, it means that power resides in culture and not just in money or in material resources. Uh, and so you can't change power entirely without changing culture, and law has a lot to do with culture. And to me, though, it means power is not merely oppressive. Power is also liberating. And what do I mean by liberating? I don't know any other way to express what I mean by liberating but that the idea that love your neighbor as yourself. And to me, that's ultimately what feminism is about. It's understanding the uses and abuses of power through the lens of women's experience. So 
Here's the personal part. Uh, because since I'm going to be talking about uh, ways to practice feminist criminal law, ways to get into doing that, he, you know, what motivates you? What, uh, what leads you to want to even think about feminist ideas or think about feminist ideas, especially as a guy? And, uh, and for me, that starts with two women in my life, my mother and my sister. My mother was raised in a generation that said women stay at home and men work. There was a problem, however, in that my dad, who worked 12 hours a day, six days a week, to put food on our table, made very little money and struggled. And even as time changed, my mom would not work because she said that's not what women do. Women stay home. And our family suffered for that. Um, we struggled in very difficult ways for that. We lived in a neighborhood where um, this was thoughtful of my mother. She would give me uh, mugging money. I had lunch money and mugging money. So the mugging money was in the pocket so that I wouldn't disappoint the muggers because she's afraid they'd hurt me. And the lunch money would go in my shoe. Uh, we couldn't afford to do better. And if my mom had worked, we could have, we were at that cusp where we could have lived at least in a safer neighborhood. Uh, and I didn't resent my mom so much for this as I resented the way she was raised, the belief she was raised with. And then there's my sister. My sister is one of the smartest people I've ever met. She is brilliant. She is hardworking. She is kind. And she's a redhead, too. <laughs> and, uh, but, She's always evaluated herself based on her appearance. At 15 years old, she would wake up early every morning to spend two hours in the mirror putting on her makeup to look just so. Uh, she um, didn't uh, uh, go to college because she thought, uh, what does that have to do with getting ahead in life? Getting ahead in life means getting the right man. And it so happened, and I'm going to truncate this part of the story now that this is taped, it so happens that um, neither of her husbands turned out to be a good match. And that I think in some ways she would feel, she does feel, that um, she suffered abuses, at least psychological abuses. And so in my mind, this obsession with beauty kept my sister from achieving wonderful things in life. And I achieved a lot of what I wanted in life. The wants haven't stopped. But a lot of what I set out to do because my parents raised me as the boy. And that's what boys do. And she was raised as the girl. And that's not what girls do. Now, I know this is a different time. but. This mattered to me. This is important to me. This is what motivates me. And so in college, I started um, taking courses where I read about feminist theory, uh, where I studied uh, women's history. I wanted to learn. I wanted to understand. It all seemed so wrong to me. And I vowed when I went into legal practice that I would try to make feminist <coughs> practice part of my life. And I think you can do that no matter what you choose to do with your career. So for example, uh, I went to law school. I, I always knew that public service, public interest was what I wanted. Money, curiously, was not a big motivator for me. I wanted just enough not to get mugged. That was my goal. It was a modest goal. Don't get mugged. Um, but I'm sure many of you will know this feeling. I was graduating law school with more loans than my mind could imagine. And so, by the way, I think there is nothing wrong with working for a law firm. But it wasn't right for me. It wasn't what I wanted to achieve with my life. But I went to work for a law firm. It was a large law firm. How do you make feminism part of your life in a large law firm? Almost all the partners were male. Um, the women were given. Um, what's sometimes been called emotional work, you know, the really difficult partners they would be assigned to so they could calm them down and make nice to them. Um, 
And, uh, but I made a point of volunteering to work with um, uh, abused women, to work with uh, dependent kids. Uh, I was appointed as a child advocate for a woman who was a, supporting herself as a prostitute, and she would um, engage in her acts of prostitution in front of her kids because there was no separate room. Uh, I volunteered when there was um, uh, litigation that raised free speech rights for women's groups. I volunteered to work on those. So I looked around. I looked for whatever I could find. But since it's not where I wanted to be, I couldn't stay doing that. I couldn't stay doing that. So I moved on to become a prosecutor, right? Now, it, but for reasons I don't fully understand, almost, at least half my good friends now are public defenders. And, <laughs> And they, and they have a simple view of prosecutors, evil. <laughs> but it wasn't my view. It wasn't my view. Uh, my, view that I was my view was that I was representing victims. Not completely. I represented the public interest. I understood that. But that I was helping victims. I was trying to help make the world a safer place. And one year, um, the chief prosecutor approached me and he said, um, you're being promoted. And this will sound strange to you, but I said, don't tell me what it is, just please don't promote me. Because I was so happy in what I was doing, I said, don't, don't promote me, I, I really don't, you know, I'm happy in what I'm doing. And he got a little angry and said, I decide what you're happy at. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he put me in charge of all juvenile rape cases. Now, um, I was fearful but very pleased because of the background I've talked about uh, to, to get this assignment. And what it meant is it covered a wide range of things. It covered uh, uh, street rapes uh, of a 40-year-old by a 17-year-old. It covered date rapes between two 16-year-olds. And it covered abuse of three-year-old children. And that was, in some ways, the most fulfilling and, in many ways, the hardest job that I've ever had. And I had to do my best because, as I hope the story I told you um, started out with about my wife shows you, I'm a guy and I have certain limitations. Um, my, my wife is very fond of an NPR story <clears throat> that the summary, the quick summary of the story is that the male chromosome has devolved in the last 12,000 years and the female has not. So her theory is without our feminine side, men would be earthworms. <laughs> so her nickname for me now is Wormy. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, I, I really worked, I wanted to understand the victim. And, uh, and so that, and ever since, I've been trying to work in my writing, in my teaching, in my scholarship, in continuing law reform work. For example, everyone I assume is taking criminal law, required first year course. Uh, so the model penal code rape sections are extraordinarily Neanderthal and offensive. So I'm working on a committee to rewrite the model penal code um, sexual offense provisions. And we're trying not just to bring them up to date, but to go beyond what's up to date and to see if we can make some real difference. So, so law reform activities, all that, has stayed a very uh, important part of, uh, of my life. OK. So what kinds of insights can feminism give you? And, and I want to talk briefly about uh, what I see as, as the most important ones. Um, uh, one is that stories matter. And it's important to tell women's stories, uh, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, the second is that the unconscious matters. And you have to understand the unconscious uh, to be an effective feminist advocate, to understand the legal arguments you need to make. Uh, three, that empathy and compassion matter. They always matter. And four, despite all the above, you have to be tolerant of others open-minded, and avoid the arrogance of certainty. Um, you know, something that is not a specifically feminist issue, 
Um, I do think that the most harmful prosecutors, I don't think there are that many evil ones, although I've met some, um, the, the most harmful prosecutors are those who are righteously indignant because they believe they are acting from word of God. And since everything they do is on God's behalf, they can't be wrong. But they are, because they're not God. Um, so it's important not to be arrogant. So stories, what kind of stories matter? So I want to tell two, two stories, a real story and, a, and then fiction. And the real story uh, is one that has haunted me and that I've written about it. And I was trying a case, a rape case, in front of a, um, a trial judge. It was a bench trial. And in the middle of the victim's testimony, the judge says, um, I want to see the lawyers in chambers. And the judge says to me, um, if you don't agree to an, a mental health examination for this victim, and he spat out the word victim, uh, I'm just going to acquit right now. I don't need any further evidence. And I was stunned by this. I had worked closely with the victim. I knew all the evidence. I had total confidence in my case. And I said, why? And he said, and this was over my objection, this came out on cross, but he said, well, she was raped once before, she says. Well, maybe you can be raped once in your life, but twice? She must have a mental health problem. Now, this puts me in an absolute quandary, right? What do you do if you have feminist beliefs, if you have feminist values, what do you do in that situation? Do I say, I will try to win my case at any cost, and if, if there's the littlest chance of winning, I will agree to the mental health examination? Do I let the victim make the decision to try to respect her autonomy, but put her through the torture that knowing that if she says no, she doesn't want to be humiliated that way, she gets an acquittal and justice isn't done, or she says uh, yes, and there still might be an acquittal, what do I do? I had to decide quickly, so I went to the victim and I asked her to decide. And she said, um, okay, I'll do the mental health exam. I have no problems. So the trial was postponed, delayed, the rest of the trial while she went to a mental health exam. However, the judge picked the person he wanted to do the mental health exam, and over my objection would not hear of anyone else doing the mental health exam. And this turned out to be, yes, psychologists and psychiatrists can have intense biases too. And he comes back with a report that says she's obviously mentally unstable, she thinks she was raped twice. And uh, he enters an acquittal. And he announces from the bench why he's entering the acquittal. Now, why did he even bother with the mental health exam? I think he did it because in every rape trial, there is a representative from Women Organized Against Rape, uh, which is an anti-rape organization, and it also supports rape victims. And he didn't want them to be going to the press, he thought. So he thought this would shield him from bad press coverage. Well, usually I don't trust the press as a prosecutor because they uh, tend to distort what you say and you can get in trouble. But with the permission of my superiors, this time I trusted the press. And, um, and we worked and we pushed and, we, and he is no longer a judge. That's the good part of the story. But there'll never be justice for this victim. And she'll never get the satisfaction she needed, and maybe not all women want that, but she needed that, and she didn't, she didn't get that. So I think there's a lot to learn there. I don't know whether I did the right thing or the wrong thing. I still can't tell you. I don't know what the right thing or the wrong thing was, but I had a struggle. So you can learn from real world stories. Now fiction. How many of you have seen um, The Little Mermaid, right? Okay, now let's be honest here, no lies. How many of you liked The Little Mermaid? Right, great, right, great Disney cartoon, great story. Well, 
I admit I love it too, but this is, <laughs> but, but it's got terrible messages. It's got terrible messages, and the messages uh, work in rape cases, and they start to affect how you subconsciously view things. So what happens? The ugly, mean witch can't get a man because she's ugly and mean and independent and strong. And the only, and she, but she needs a man to have absolute power. She can't have power without a man. So she turns herself into a stereotypically beautiful woman, and she steals the beautiful voice of the Little Mermaid. And the Little Mermaid is told you can only get a man if you don't speak, if you have no voice. And the Little Mermaid agrees to this deal. But guess what? The Little Mermaid's losing. The, the, the dupe prince is falling for the witch because of her physical beauty and because of the beauty of her singing voice. Well, the mermaid finally gets back her man, but how does she do this? She does it not by a real voice, not by speaking her real needs, but by getting back the beauty of her singing voice. And now that her beauty is complete and perfect, the beauty of her voice and the beauty of her physical appearance match, she gets her man, and her life is perfect, and the story is over. This plays out in rape trials, too. And, um, and this takes me to part of what I want to talk about, about the unconscious, the role of the unconscious. So two things happen at rape trials. One is these stories come into play. So women who express a voice, who express needs, who express interest in sexuality uh, end up not being believed. These kind of stories, uh, not being believed, by the way, by jurors who self-identify as feminists. There have been studies done of these. But you give those jurors a specific case and they say, no, reasonable doubt. And the second interesting thing, and this takes me back to my Deborah Tannen story at the beginning, is the nature of language. So there's this theory of women's language. And the theory of women's language says that um, women have a different way of speaking than men, right? That women, instead of saying, I want this, will say, could you please do me this? I'd really appreciate a favor. And women will hedge more, and they won't speak as much in a public setting. Um, here's the thing. It turns out that when linguists study this, there is no such thing as women's language. What there is is a status-based language. So those in a lower status position adopt what is called male or female women's language. But there's a complication. Because everyone hears women speaking women's language even when they don't. Now, why is that bad? It's bad because anyone who speaks women's language is perceived as kind and loving liars. They are perceived as not telling the truth. Whereas anyone who speaks stereotypically men's language are perceived as not so nice, but competent and truthful. Men, not nice, competent and truthful. Women, nice little liars. So you walk into a courtroom and automatically the woman is a, a disadvantage because she has these stories that are working against her and she has um, the uh, the language differences, perceived language differences working against her. And it's, that alone makes it very hard to win rape cases. So if you're a prosecutor, you have to be attentive to this. You have to think about, how do I respond to these things? Can I use an expert to help educate the jury? Can I um, prepare a, a woman to speak in a way that cuts a fine line? And is there anything unethical about that? Because if a woman speaks in too manly a fashion, she's disliked and disbelieved too, right? What do you do? And so I've written a fair amount about how you struggle with that um, as, uh, as a prosecutor. Um, another uh, point I want to make, and I don't want to, um, I want to say two things. We're going to have some time for questions, and if anyone can stay after, I'll answer more questions. But I'm yakking on so long, partly because um, Amanda made the mistake of setting aside a separate question hour later, which only encouraged, never encouraged a law professor to speak. Bad, bad. Need time limits. Um, 
So, uh, so I want to talk about the problem of the truthful rapist, another bit of the un unconscious. And here's what I mean by truthful rapist. So um, this may sound incredible to you, but true. And as a middle-aged man, I'll have a couple of illustrations. But um, I, oh, I can't do that. The microphone, microphone. Okay. Uh, I, uh, here was the defense that a lot of young men made to rape trials. I don't need to rape a woman. Look at me. I don't need to rape a woman. I mean, who wouldn't want me? And I realized I had so many men say this. I think they were telling the truth. I think a lot of them, that the woman did consent, but a lot of them were convinced no matter what the woman said or did, they consented because the man couldn't conceive consciously that any woman would not want to have sex with him. Well, if they're truthful, that raises a whole host of difficult questions. And what got me thinking about this is the Kobe Bryant case. Are any of you familiar with Kobe Bryant, right? Fam famous basketball player um, uh, accused of rape. Well. Um, the, the detectives recorded their interview with Kobe Bryant. And they recorded the interview, and when they recorded the interview, they, uh, they asked him point blank, they said, did she ever say no? And Kobe said nothing for two minutes, dead silence. And they said, and he looked down, he looked at his shoes, and they said, Mr. Bryant, did she say no? And he said, well, she consented. And the detective said, well, 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 that's not what I asked you. <laughs> did she say no? And he looked down at his shoes again, didn't make eye contact, and after two minutes he said, no, she never said no. Now, the way the detectives read this was that he honestly believed she consented because he was Kobe Bryant, and who would say no to Kobe Bryant? But it was also the case she did say no. And he understood that that wouldn't look good for him to admit that she said no. In other words, guess what? He was capable of understanding that most people would view a no from a crying woman as meaning, I don't know, no. So that means he was capable of understanding, and he just didn't want to. And it turns out there is a lot of research on what's called motivated reasoning. So here's the idea. You have uh, two big uh, systems in your brain. The control deliberative system, it's what we think of as the conscious. And the automatic system, what we think of as the unconscious. But in fact, there aren't just two. There's a continuum and degrees of how aware and conscious you are of things. Uh, and so, um, motivated reasoning kicks in. What's motivated reasoning? If it's not in your self-interest to consciously be aware of something, you kick it downstairs. You push it out of your conscious mind. And I've argued in uh, a couple of articles that that's exactly what's going on with a lot of the truthful rapists. They know at some level that the woman is not consenting, but they don't want to confront the implications of that. And so they push it down to their subconscious. So what do you do about that? Can you punish someone for their subconscious thoughts? Well, um, it would take too much time. I've definitely prepared more than I should have in terms of material uh, to answer the question. Uh, but my question is, uh, yes, it depends on the, uh, the test that you use, the test that you use. And if you have an objective test, what a reasonable man it, the, I know this sounds a little, it's not a good phrase, but the phrase I use is the reasonably sexually sensitive man, a man who was paid any sort of minimal attention <laughs> to the desires of his partner, would have known. And you instruct the jury on that. That's the standard you have to follow. Um, you're not inquiring into their subconscious thoughts in a particular instance. But you're asking, look, this is the moral standard we should set. 
and it doesn't have to be man, we can make it gender neutral, but caring about someone else, that's an okay message for the criminal law to send. You have to care enough about someone else to care at least what they want and what they think before you engage in sexual relations. All right, so I'm just gonna make a, a couple of other real quick comments so we at least have some time to talk before you have to um, uh, go back to, to class. Um, so I focused on sexual assault. Well, that seems like the easy thing. Um, but thinking about these issues led me to realize that there are implications way beyond sexual assault uh, for feminist thinking for, uh, for all of law. Uh, Professor Orenstein has written extensively on uh, feminist implications for evidence law, the federal rules of evidence, and uh, what would any feminist federal rules of evidence look like. In fact, I have, a, I have a project for her, I think, a seminar where you have your class draft a feminist version of the rules of evidence. That would be cool. I think that would be cool. Uh, you're going to hear from Amanda now. You're in trouble. You are. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but, but so give you just, just one quick, and I'll, I'll make this a, a last story. Um, the Ferguson case in uh, South Carolina uh, is a Fourth Amendment case. And you can actually find little seeds of feminist-like thinking, believe it or not, in some of the mostly horrible jurisprudence of the United States Supreme Court. And, uh, and this is a case where um, there was believed to be a crack baby ep epidemic. And I'm not gonna get into whether that was real or was not real. And so uh, the, this was the only publicly funded hospital uh, in the area and uh, it's the only place pregnant women had to go for care. And uh, the police and the staff of the hospital got together and said, Let's prevent crack babies. So what we're gonna do is if we find any woman who signs a consent form to treatment that is needed for her baby, for her yet unborn uh, child, um, we will consider that without mentioning it in the form. We will consider that to include testing for cocaine use. And uh, we will then tell the mother uh, that she has to comply with a cocaine abuse program. And if she doesn't comply in any way, we're going to arrest her and prosecute her for child abuse. Poor women often can't afford the bus fare to get to the counseling session. They show up 10 minutes late, they're arrested, they're locked up. So the United States Supreme Court was faced with the question, was this an ordinary criminal search requiring probable cause when you tested their, um, uh, their blood and their urine, or was this uh, for those of you who've taken Crim Pro, um, was this a special needs search that could have something less than that? Um, and long story short, the court concludes, no, it has a criminal purpose. Why do they conclude that? The only sensible way I can understand it is they conclude it is so stigmatizing in our culture to accuse a woman of being an abusive mother of her child, much less a drug abusing woman of a child, that Adding that stigma itself is the equivalent of a criminal conviction in what it does to humiliate the woman. That seems awfully forward thinking to me of the United States Supreme Court. And secondly, their ordinary position for consent searches is they only have to be voluntary. You don't have to, they shouldn't be beaten out of somebody. Uh, but in this, they cited Miranda and said, for these women, the test for consent should be, did they have a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent understanding? And we should take their class position, they don't say in those words, but they do that, into account. Very forward thinking. I think maybe Justice Ginsburg might have had something to do with some of that thought of it. So, bottom line, the real message I'm trying to convey is that um, Feminism does not have to be some pie in the sky, idealistic, intellectual thing you do as a student and you throw overboard when you're done. Uh, it can guide your career, it can guide your personal life, it can guide your professional life in ways that are really fulfilling. And I hope, I, I really do apologize for going on so long. And I hope that uh, each of you will at least take a little inspiration for your own life goals from that. Uh, and uh, maybe we can have a few questions and more of you will show up for the question and answer later. So thank you.
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, have any courts allowed or adopted the um, reasonable doubt standard when it comes to the sexually sensitive uh, Interestingly, I will tell you that there are courts that have cited to it uh, and not to trash it. Um, but to say, you know, maybe this is, should affect how our jury instructions are done, and um, this is thought provoking, but not adopting the standard. So keep working on it. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lose hope on that. Um, questions, comments, career advice? Yeah. What are your thoughts on coaching the way in which um, a victim dresses? talks, acts to, you know, yeah. reach the best possible outcome for that victim, but Boy. at the same time imposing those societal standards on them. Sure. Okay, so, so I always view the point of coaching witnesses. In, in Britain, coaching witnesses is a crime. You, you, you can't do that. Um, we have a different view. I always view coaching a witness as a way to help the witness tell the truth. Because if the witness, you have to prepare the witness to testify in a way that his or her truth comes across to the jury. And there can be so many obstacles that prevent that truth from being heard. So I don't view it as, as getting the witness to fool or to lie, but to be more effective at being truthful. That being said, there's a social cost to exactly your question. It's a really hard question, right? So. Um, I always opted for asking the witness to dress in more stereotypically uh, modest fashion, but not pushing, but explaining my reasons why. So I felt I'm respecting the witness by explaining the reasons why. Uh, but why it, it's wrong, right, in, in another way. It's not fair. Why should juries judge you just because of the clothes? that you're wearing. But guess what? They will judge you. That's the problem. Even I'm telling you this, even the feminists on the jury, ah, go feminism. And then they see, oh, look at that dress. Um, so that was how I um, resolved the tension. So, so um, I feel guilty about that. I feel guilty about everything in life, actually. It's just a <laughs> personal trait I have. Um, but. Um, it's, it's, it's a really hard, I even I remember one case that stood out for me, there was a woman who was um, Latina and she didn't speak uh, English at all. So I had a translator and, I, uh, and she showed up at the preliminary hearing in a very revealing outfit. And, I, and after the preliminary hearing was over, I asked the translator if she could translate. And I, I asked her if you know, she could dress any different way and she was quite offended. And she said, this is how I dress. What's wrong with how I dress? And this is how women in my neighborhood dress. And I said, there's nothing wrong with how you dress. There's absolutely nothing wrong with how you dress. Unfortunately, here's how the jury's going to view it. So then I had a different problem. So how am I supposed to get the money? I don't own suits. I don't own long skirts. I'm ethically barred from giving her the money. Um, so what I do, I just said, you know, whatever you're able to do, you should do. And so she showed up with a shawl to cover, you know, she probably borrowed from her grandma and she put together something that was a more modest, but boy, it's, it's hard, you know. I think that's another lesson. You can never be totally ethically pure. You can't. Wish I could, but you can't. Yeah. How, I just had a little trouble hearing from, from oh, the back. Sorry. As a male feminist, have you ever you know, called out a male colleague for sex abuse? How do they take that? Oh, yeah. What's your experience with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have done that. Um, I have done that. Uh, and um, so this may surprise some of the women in the class, but when men are together, they tend to engage in behavior they might not engage in uh, in front of women who know them. Um, I, I have called out I have called out colleagues, uh, but I've done it never publicly. I always take them aside, you know, trying not to humiliate someone in a public fashion. 
Uh, I'll usually get some, you know, oh, you're uptight, you're blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, with, with prosecutor colleagues, <laughs> I bring out the literature and I bring out the, um, talk about the rules of ethics and what their obligations are. Um, kind of viewed it as teaching and plus the, the, the rap you always get if you, if you um, stick to an ideological position. Oh yeah, I left out a, the part about being tolerant of others, but um, uh, if you stick to it, is that you have no sense of humor. Uh, and so the only thing I can tell you is I had some credence with my colleagues on that. Not because I think I'm the funniest guy in the world, but I at least am jovial most of the time. So they had trouble saying I didn't have a sense of humor. Uh, and it was easy to say, well, you laugh at my jokes about other things, but this suddenly I have no sense of humor. That's how I'd, I'd handle it. Um, but again, not, not always easy. But I'm not a believer in public humiliation because that breeds resistance, you know, a private conversation. Yeah, and I'll get your hand. That's a great question. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there's been a lot of research. So um, there's, been, there's been a lot of research on uh, jury selection. And there are the, the, the best research suggests that for the most part, all the fancy psychological tests and all the jury consultants don't work and that the law firms are actually wasting their money uh, on that, not for doing mock trials and getting feedback. That's a very helpful thing that they help do, but for coming up with these questions. But there's more recent research that suggests you can get at it indirectly. Uh, so there's something called the status quo bias. And this is what it sounds like. It's favoring the status quo. You like things the way they are. You don't like change, or you like things the way you perceive they are. Um, it so happens that the intensity of, almost everyone has some status quo bias. Um, the intensity of status quo bias uh, increases if you're male, white, politically conservative. Um, and the more you have status quo bias, the more likely you are to embrace um, sexist presuppositions. So you can get at it indirectly if a judge will let you administer a test, and there are very few judges. I know of some trial judges who've been willing to try that. I'm not sure there are any reported appellate opinions on it. Um, judges don't like it. I don't know if they're afraid of, you know, I have to tell you, have you all, have you all heard of the implicit association test, right, where you, how quickly you respond, you see a, an image of a black face and a white face, and they flash the word good, and how quickly can you press good when you see the black face rather than the white face? And if it takes more time, it's be, the, the supposition is it's because you didn't expect that. Good and African American, how can those things be together? And so you're slowing down. Um, I was at a, a meeting where the implicit association test was being demonstrated to prosecutors and defense attorneys. And they asked for a volunteer in public to take the test and all the results. This takes guts. I will tell you that um, I'm actually very proud of him. I don't think you'd mind me mentioning his name. He's no longer a prosecutor, but um, he was, um, uh, his name is Bill Shepard. And uh, he volunteered. He was the chief prosecutor for his office. And it showed he was biased. <laughs> and he's not hugely biased, but he was past the moderate bias line. And, um, he, because of that experience, he ended up supporting an ABA project, which is ongoing now, to help to overcome implicit bias in jury selection. Uh, so, about two more years, we'll get back to you on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm one of these people you mentioned that more of a public defense bent. I don't think all prosecutors are evil. Thank um, you. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I do wonder, you know, it, it seems to me that one of the things we have to do to create a more just world generally, part of that is dismantling the mass incarceration state. Oh, yeah. 
And so I, I, my question is, to what extent can prosecutions be a tool for social change? Yep. So I'm not questioning, you know, in, this, in a single case, sure. what value is there? But sure, right. It's, it's, it's a terrific question. Um, I, uh, there's a, a friend of mine named Paul Butler, who's a former um, prosecutor, whose answer is, uh, you can't do justice and be a prosecutor. The system is so irredeemably evil that no matter how nice a person you are, um, you can't. I don't agree with Paul on that. And I can give you lots of examples. So the, uh, the Brooklyn uh, DA's office started uh, on its own a uh, drug treatment program for felony repeat offenders. The courts, drug courts don't do that. They take, you know, first time misdemeanor felony repeat offenders. They designed it and they hired social scientists to come in and uh, evaluate the effectiveness of their programs. Uh, they've been very successful in keeping felons out of prison by doing that program. Uh, there, are, um, there are other prosecutors, uh, Craig Watkins in Dallas uh, has been working to uh, investigate uh, racial bias and how it, it leads to increased incarceration and has brought in social scientists to review what he's done and changing policies. So policies can, can, can uh, increase mass incarceration in very indirect ways. To give you one example, there's one office, I can't remember which one, uh, one prosecutor's office where um, they had a, a, a rule and the rule was you, they, you had to pay bail, there had to be some bail money if you lived more than 100 miles from the court to ensure you would show. Well, Guess what? Most of the people whose bail were revoked were Native Americans. Why? Because the only thing there was about 100 miles from the court was a Native American reservation, right? And, uh, and so they studied this and said, right, we didn't mean anything bad by it, but look what's happening. So they changed the rules. Now that not only prevents more people being in jail awaiting trial, but there's a, 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 a clear correlation between whether you are in jail or out of jail pre-trial and whether you get acquitted or whether you get a good plea deal. Because if you're out of prison, you're out of jail, you're better able to work with your lawyer, you're better able to help find witnesses. Um, so that's a small way that you can, you can combat mass incarceration. So long story short, uh, I agree with you. I think mass incarceration is uh, one of the civil rights issues of the 21st century. Uh, but I don't buy that prosecutors have no positive role to play in that. Again, does that mean each and every day you're not doing some things that you feel uncomfortable with? Yes, but in my mind is the answer to walk away. Um, you know, my friend Paul says no good human being should be a prosecutor. So let's follow that to its logical conclusion. Only evil human beings will be left to be prosecutors. I don't find that a good choice. So it's the best response I can, I can give you. Yes? Um, you talked a little bit about the feminist language and it really being a status. And I am just curious, in your experience in prosecution offices, there is a tendency to want to seek cases that you're going to win. And you're more likely to win a case, especially a rape case, yep. when it's a, a prudential issue, if you have a defendant who has that lower status speak. So, do you see policies in place in prosecution offices to kind of highlight that, to make sure people are yeah. thinking about that when they're deciding what cases to charge? Because I just see that as a socioeconomic impact. It, it's a, it's a, another fantastic question. Uh, so it depends on the prosecutor's office. There are enlightened prosecutor's offices and not so enlightened prosecutor's office. And, and I don't think a prosecutor can choose and say, I will go forward with every case no matter what. Um, there's, a, there's a real cost to victims in going through the case. It's a very difficult thing. But that being said, um, I think there are prosecutors' offices in this country that are cowardly. I don't know any other word for it. Uh, there's too high a chance of losing. That will affect my win rate that I can announce when I run for office. I want to announce a ridiculously high win rate, and so I'm just not going to take on the case. Well, that denies victims justice. It doesn't do anything to combat the, the existing attitudes, right? What are the cases you're most likely to lose? Exactly the cases where some stereotype is violated, where a woman dressed a certain way or said a certain thing. You're just reinforcing the system. You have to be willing to combat that. 
Um, many large prosecutor's offices have special rape units uh, where the, they, they select their best prosecutors and their most um, emotionally astute prosecutors. And they, uh, and they have their own investigative staff to build cases that look weak and to try and strengthen them. Uh, so it, it varies very much with the prosecutor's office. Let me just add a footnote, and it, it plays off of the earlier question, too. Uh, the the, the sky-high uh, conviction rates uh, partly come from threatening guilty, threatening horrible punishment if you don't plead guilty, but they partly come from how underfunded defense counsel is in the United States. So I'll give you a quick example. I think the best, and I could explain later why this is, the, the best funded, most talented public defender's office in the United States is the Public Defender Service of the District of Columbia. The short reason for that is they only handle serious cases. All the minor cases go to private counsel. So they have a small caseload relative to most other offices, but they're well, well funded. Uh, nationwide acquittal rates range from 5%, 5% to maybe a high of 15%. In the District of Columbia, there's a 35% acquittal rate. And I think that is because of having better defense counsel. Now, that being said, if we're talking about a sexual assault case, I don't want high acquittal rates, right? Um, and, and that raises a whole other question. How, do you, how can you be a feminist public defender, for example? Um, and all I, there are different views on that. I would recommend, if any of you are thinking about public defenders, reading uh, ab work by Abby Smith, who is a public defender who considers herself a feminist, but um, uh, will fight tooth and nail to defend her clients in, in rape cases. It's a, it's a tough issue. I think we're going to stop now. Please, if you have more questions, please come back to the Q&A at 4.30 in uh, room 335. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.